Life and Times of John de Wycliffe. Chapter 3. Dissatisfaction with Ecclesiastical Affairs. Wycliffe's controversy with the Medicants, his promotion, disputes in which he was involved, his appeal to the pontiff, his rising and widening influence, is probably known to the court, his embassy to Rome. Though founded in the 6th century, it was not till the middle of the 10th that the monastery order put forth in England any very positive symptoms of life and energy. And Stan, their leader and apologist, was a man of most commanding abilities and pretending to have received a divine revelation in their favor, exerting his great talents and influence on their behalf. Their professed separation from the world, with their severe discipline and pure life, raised them high in public esteem. Nor can it be denied that amongst the intelligent, the poor, and inactivity of the Middle Ages, the monastery offered the best retreat for letters and for learning, and in many instances proved the school of a stern and lofty virtue. We lose nothing by admitting, in common with the most eminent Protestants and Romanists, but looked after the ecclesiastic hierarchy. Europe had in all probability become the prey of tyrants or the theater of perpetual wars, or had been reduced to a barren desert, that the hierarchy did not only oppose the progress of the despotus in Europe, but preserved the elements of civilization, and upheld in the recollection of men that which is so easily effaced, the ties which bind earth to heaven. But did not the hierarchy itself become a despotism? Was ever despotism more crushing or more destructive? Did not a supreme selfishness become the infecting genius of every order of the priesthood? The monks laid aside their severe habits and gave themselves up to indulgency and personal aggrandizement. Wealth and luxury converted the monasteries into so many castles of indifference. The ambition and adherence of the cathedral budded and blossomed and bore their deadly fruits beneath the shade of the covenant. Uh, abuses multiplied daily. People were scandalized and indignant. The demand for a change was loud and all but universal. All this crisis, the papacy environed by adversaries and presenting so many vulnerable points, acceptably gladness the services of an order which promised to exhibit to the world an image of primitive simplicity and self-denial. In them, the pontificate would be provided with a hearty and devoted militia, thoroughly prepared for all the various tendencies of our, her warfare. On the one hand, she would be efficiently guarded against the hostility of the princes, and on the other, against the encroachment of heresy. The most ample and honorable privileges were accordingly lavished on those fraternities which made a voluntary adjugation of property and whose members were ready to disperse themselves throughout Christendom, relying for the support on the alms of the faithful and for their influence on the example of an austere, laborious, and aesthetic life. For a considerable time the new institution did its office to admiration. The fact was like the transfusion of fresh, life blood into a decaying system. The genius of the institution penetrated quickly into every department of ecclesiastical agency, whether high or low, whether obscure or eminent. It intruded itself into the region of parochial duty. It seated itself in the confessional. It seized on the chair of the university. It, it grabbed the frostier of episcopacy. It held the seals of civil office and the portfolio of dom diplomatic intrigue. Till at last it appeared probable that the confidence and veneration of nearly the whole Catholic world would be transferred from their established guides to these professors of primitive sanctity and perfection. It was in the beginning of the 13th century that there arose this new religious order of the mendicants or begging friars who professed to abjure all property or settled revenue, and to depend for their support on the charitable contribution of voluntary offerings of the faithful. It was Pope Innocent III himself, irreproachably, in private life and deeply alive in the vices of the priesthood, who first instituted this order and distinguished it with special remarks of his protection and favor. 
mendicants rendered important service to the church and continue to enjoy the patronage and support of succeeding pontiffs. The esteem in which they were held by the highest dignitaries so tended to multiply their numbers that they began to swarm in all the states of Europe till they became obnoxious to the people and burdensome to the church. To repress their growth and influence was now an object to be desired. With this view, Gregory X, in a general council, which he assembled at Lyons in 1272, reduced them to the four orders of the Dominicans, the Presbyterians, Francescans, Carmelites, and the Hermits of St. Augustine. The power of the first two orders far surpassed that of the other two. They were, in fact, prior to the Reformation, what the Jesuits had been since the memorable change, the very soul of the hierarchy determining all political affairs and all ecclesiastical movements. These four mendicant orders had liberty to travel at pleasure, to mingle in any circle, to take on themselves the education of people, and began to assume a position and a preeminence, but little consistent with their original professions of humility and self-denial. This was the natural consequence of the esteem and veneration in which they were held, as well as the enthusiastic attachment with which the people occurred to them. They busied themselves in temporal and political affairs of the greatest moment, in composing the differences of princes, including treaties of peace, concerning allies, presiding in cabinet councils, governing uh, courts, levying taxes, and doing many other offices not only remote from, but absolutely inconsistent with, their more sacred character of profession. Nor was this all. They claimed superiority over every other order of the priesthood and asserted that they had a divine commission, that they enjoyed special intercourse with heaven, that to them was revealed the true method of obtaining salvation, and hence the people should receive the sacraments from their hands alone and should commit their souls to the care of none other. Encouraged and secured by the pontiff, they ushered the office and invaded the privileges of the conventual clergy. According to Matthew Paris, they were overbearing insulin, frequently inquired of the devout by whom they had been confessed, and if the answer was, by my own priest, they replied, and here is that ignoramus. We never heard lectures in theology. We never, we never gave his nights to the study of the decrees. We never learned to unravel knotty questions. They were all blind and leaders of the blind. Come to us who know how to distinguish leper from leper. And to such a degree did they retain their credit and influence that towards the close of the 14th century, great numbers of both sexes sought admission into the orders as the most infallible method of attaining God's favor and of securing eternal life. Though protected by pontifical authority from all opposition, whether, whether more open or more secret, they began to be looked upon with growing suspicion and distrust. Even the illustrious Rosetes, G-R-O-S-S-E-T-E-S-T-E-E, -E -E, who had not only extended to them his patronage and support, but lavished on them his favor, was so impressed with their apathy and pride and ambition, with their restless and turbulent spirit, as it manifested itself in various parts of the kingdom, that he denounced them as the heaviest curse of the church and the greatest obstacle to the cause of Christian truth. In the prosecution of their itinerant labors, they forced their way into the foremost ranks of society and into the center of every circle. And though they bore the name and clothed themselves in the attire of friars and mendicants, they lived yet luxuriously, reveled in indulgency, and drained the poorest of the people for their own personal aggrandizement. It is matter of Malachian precedence that within the four and twenty years of their establishment in England, these friars had piled up their mansions to a royal altitude, in pungently transgressing the bounds of poverty, the very base of the profession, they fulfilled to the letter the ancient prophecies of Hildegata, and exhibited inestimable treasures within their spacious edifice and lofty walls. They beset the dying bed of the noble and the wealthy, in order to extort secret bequests from the fears of guilt or superstition. No one now has any hope of salvation but through the ministry of the preachers or the monuments. They are found at the court in the character of counselors and chamberlains and treasurers and negotiators of marriage. 
as the agent of ancient agents of popal extortions, they are incessantly applying the arts of flattery, the stings of rebuke, or the terrors of confession. They pour contempt on the sound orders of the Benedites and Augustine, and according to their estimate, the black cowled brethren are as much superior to the monks as the disciples of Epicurus, who would be so many simpletons and boors. As Oxford was the first seat residence of the mendicants, so there the first vigorous opponents of their errors and their encouragements made his appearance. Good note. It was in 1221 that Gilbert de Francine and twelve of the brethren settled in England under the sanction of the founder of the Dominicans and the Pagot. Critchrow, who was chosen chancellor of the university in 1233, famously assailed the order and laid bare the hypocrisy, ambition, arrogance, and the evil tendency of their doctrines, not only to the hierarchy, but to the general well-being of society. Their letters of fraternity were nothing less than indulgences, which they guarded and sold, whose benefits were multiplied and extended according to the wealth of their purchaser, and whose influence might reach beyond death itself. Such was the extortion practiced by the order, such as the positive pillage and robbery, which they committed on the more credits, that the reformer described their instruments of deception as powdered with hypocrisies, covenancies, simons, blasphemies, and other leasings, and such were the mean and sordid arts to which they had recourse to proselyze and draw away the people from the more ancient clergy, such as the licentiousness and the vices which they encouraged, such the low devices which they employed to withdraw the youth from the university, that we wonder not that the chancellor should have treated them with the most caustic application. In the year 1357, Prince Ralph fearlessly arraigned the whole order before the Pope at Avignon, A-B-I-G-N-O-N. His conclusions published at the papal court could not but be known to Wycliffe, whose soul burned with a just and holy indignation against the fraternity. In three short years, after preferring his complaints, the archbishop died. His spirit, however, survived. The work of the Reformation passed into other and not less able hands. But if the death of Fitzralph was regarded by his opponents as the triumph of their cause, the triumph was but short-lived. If for some years Wycliffe had not been so conspicuous on the field of action, he had only withdrawn to dis decipher and prepare himself for his next appearance. The crisis called for the man and God in his good providence set forth set forth the men fitted for the crisis. The death of the Archbishop left the Reformer in the undisputed possession of the ground on which was to be conducted the great conflict between the corruption and reformation. The principles of light and darkness, of good and evil, were now to be stirred to their very depth, and on the victory of the one or the other depended the future veal or the future wool of England. The appeal was to be made not to the papacy but to the people. The Wycliffe commended, commenced his attack on the notorious and widespread abuses of this sanctimonious order as early as the year 1360. It was not until 1380 that he published his treatise entitled Objections to Fires, in which he assailed them as the pest of society, the enemies of religion, the patrons and promoters of every crime. Good note. This tract, together with his petition to the king, and the Parliament was printed in a small volume at the Oxford Press in 1608. Towards its conclusion, the reformer says that the friars have caused the beginning and maintaining of perturbation uh, in Christendom and of all evils of this world. These errors shall never be amended till friars be brought to freedom of the gospel and clean religion of Jesus Christ. End of the footnote. These objections which are arranged under 50 distinct heads or chapters, were about the accumulated and combined reasoning which the reformer had employed during the preceding 20 years. His writings abound with the severest invective against the life and practice of the order. His hatred of them never changed. His opposition to their conduct rather strengthened and became more invigorated. In the hour of sickness, even, he could not suffer them to escape.
being visited by a deputation from the body, who reminded him of the injury which they had sustained from his continued opposition and attacks, and who urged him to recant before his death. We are told that he heard them in silence, then beckoning to his attendants to raise him in bed, and summoning all the strength he could command, he cried aloud, I shall not die but live, and shall again declare the evil deeds of the priors. The first establishment having been at Oxford, and the university being provoked by their continued and but two successful attempts to seduce her youthful members, passed the statute in which it was provided that no one should be received into the fraternity of the mendicants until he had reached the age of eighteen. The friars, however, were not to be deterred by any authority which did not proceed immediately from Rome, and Rome, instead of interposing her influence to arrest them in their progress, cheered them on in their course, and seconded their efforts with dispensations of a character which reduced the statute of the university to mere waste paper. All the wealth and all the influence of the order were employed to render abortive each of its provisions. The strife deepened and became yet more severe. The attitude of both parties grew more resolute and more warlike. In the heat of the contest, Wycliffe appeared as the champion of the ancient institutions and the uncompromising antagonist of the friars. So firm was his bearing and so important was the service which he rendered. At in year 1361, and in the midst of his reform movements, he became the subject of special promotion and honor. The Society of Daliel College presented him with the Church of Bellingham, a living of considerable value in the Diocese of Lincoln. Footnote. This living he exchanged in 1368 for that of Lucasel, L-U-T-G-E-R-S-A-L, or Lucasel, in the arch deaconry of Bucks, of less value indeed, but nearer to Oxford, and the footnote, and then conferred on him the dignity of warden. This he resigned four years afterwards for the same office in Canterbury Hall, to which he was raised through the enlightened and liberal friendship of the primate Simon de Edlip, a man no less distinguished for his profound learning than for his love of truth and his piety. In originating this foundation, the Archbishop designed it for the benefit of eleven scholars, eight of whom were to be clerks or secular clergymen, and the other three, with the warden or master, were to be chosen from the monks of Church, Christ Church, Canterbury. The headship was first conferred on a monk of the name of Woodhall, whose restless and turbulent spirit had greatly disquieted the university and proved a fruitful source of disorder. Having thrown the whole force and violency of his temper into the disputes which distracted and divided the sacred and the secular clergy, Eslip availed himself of a provision in the institution which empowered him to remove both the warden and the three monks associated with him, and in supplying their places with an equal number of secular scholars, invited our reformers to the vacant office of mastery as a man in whose honesty of life, in whose laudable conversation, and in whose knowledge of letters, as well as in whose fidelity, circumspection, and industry he could implicitly confide. This was a stroke of consummate policy, but the appointment had little more than been perfected when the primate was removed by death. Peter Langham, who had previously been a private monk and abbot of Westminster, was translated from the See of Ely to that of Canterbury. His elevation was the signal for the downfall of Wycliffe. An appeal was preferred by Woodhall and his expelled associates to the new archbishop, and on the pretense that Islip had acted under the influence of misrepresentation or in circumstances in which he was incompetent to form a rational decision, the monks were restored and Woodhall reinstated to the office of master. Into the whole of this dispute is, it is not needful to enter. Suffice it to say that Wycliffe, conscious of his own integrity, and assured that he had been raised to the wardenship in conformity with the provisions of the institution and the will of its founder, made his appeal to the pontiff. Crushed and perplexed with the difficulties which beset the question, the Pope transferred its investigation to one of his cardinals. Its sentiments was delayed and still put off. While the matter was thus pending, Wycliffe, could not be ignorant that the slightest indication of feeling hostile 
to the claims of the Romish preludes would be marked by his opponents and reported to the Apple Court with suitable comments and darkest coloring. From December 1365 to March 1367, he had possessed his wardenship, and from his part in the appeal to the pontiff, he must be supposed to have felt somewhat solicitous to preserve it. Had his spirit been capable of subjection to a little calculating policy, he would doubtless have, have abstained, at least for a while, from his attacks on a class of men known in their most effective agents of the papal, papal power. It was, however, while this cause was pending, that the zeal of Wycliffe as the enemy of corruption, whether of the head or the members of the hierarchy, became so far conspicuous as to attract attention from the highest authorities in the realm. His pen was still employed, and his voice was still heard in defiance of the defense of the university, opposing that independency of its laws which the popes had attempted in favor of the mendicants, nor was he less active in the cause of parochial clergy, whose flocks were frequently estranged from them by the influence of those more devoted ministers of the superstitions and of the, the despotic authority of Rome. It is again needful to refer to the historical fact that John had basely surrendered a British crown to Pope Innocent III. England was the vassal of Rome. It is true that the act of homage had been on the part of the sovereign constantly and carefully evaded, that the annual tribune to the Holy See had been frequently interrupted, that for more than thirty years it had not been paid at all, and that the people had ever been impatient under the iron bondage of a foreign yoke. Still the Pope claimed supremacy. In the year 1365, Urban, verse 5, preferred his claim to the annual feudal acknowledgment of 1,000 marks, together with all arrears for the three and thirty years preceding. In default of payment, the monarch was admonished that he would be cited by process to appear before the sovereign pontiff. It was not to be expected that a daring spirit like that of Edward III would ever submit to be the slave of the church and court of Rome. His conduct was such as became the prince of a mighty people and a growing empire. He not only declined the tribune, but in the following year appealed to his parliament for the settlement of a question in which the honor of the nation was so deeply and immediately involved. Happy for the future freedom and independency of the country, both houses were unanimous in maintaining that neither John nor any other prince had power thus to subject the realm of England without consent of Parliament, that not only had such consent never been obtained, but that the king, in so acting, had violated his coronation oath. The nobility and the people ranged themselves on the side of Parliament and stood pledged to support the cause of the monarch against the pretentious and claims of the pontiff. Yet there were men mean enough to betray their country to the political claim. They dreamed, as others had dreamed before them, that the civil power should ever be in subordination to the ecclesiastical authority, and to ensure the subordination, they were prepared to enter into conflict with every opposing force. Presenting the doctrine of the Parliament, an anonymous monk took up the defense of the papal claim, but not satisfied with putting himself in the attitude of defense, he threw him threw down the gauntlet and challenged to a closer fight the force and fire of England's purest intellect. His aim was to draw our reformer into the arena, and by putting him in, in opposition to political authority, rendered him obnoxious to the Holy See. Nothing intimidated, and still trusting to the righteous of his cause, Wycliffe accepted the challenge and undertook to prove, in opposition to this monarch, monastic apologist, that the sovereign of England had neither been forfeited to the Pope, and that the clergy were not either force and fire of England's purest intellects, person and property from subjection to the civil power. As the controversy involved the whole question of the pontiff's temporal authority, and as this authority was so intimately blended with his spiritual power, our reformer was careful to guard himself at the very outset against the imputation of unthankfulness to the church. Nothing was further from his thoughts at this time than the intention to damage her or her interests in the estimation of her own children. He was simply the opponent of the proud and undue pretensions, the irreconcilable flow of existing and deepening corruption. Nor can we overlook the fact that 
By this time, his fame as one of the ablest disputants of the age must have been fully established. He was challenged not by a prior, but by a member of a monastic order between whom and the friars there had hitherto been anything but a feeling of brotherhood or of goodwill. The grand proposition of the monk was this, that all dominions granted under a condition is, by the violation of the condition, dissolved that the Lord Pope granted to our king the realm of England under the condition that England should annually pay 700 marks and 300 for Ireland, which condition has, from time to time, been disregarded. And therefore, King of England had has long since fallen from the sovereignty of England. In his reply, Wycliffe maintained, Number one, that the sovereign is the supreme head of the state within civil and ecclesiastical, and therefore has the right in connection with the parliament not only to deny the tribute claimed, but even to alienate the property of the church. This doctrine he affirmed to be in conformity with the law and the ancient practice of the realm. Number two, that if in certain aspects this doctrine was in variance with certain ecclesiastical canons, it was yet in accordance with the claims of natural right, the maximums of civil law, and the teachings of the Book of God. Number three, that as first and chief in the following of Christ, who had not where to lay his head, the Pope's influence should be limited to his spiritual functions and all civil homage denied him, that the influence of the Pontiff and his cardinals had rather than to the detriment of the nation's religious life and privileges, that the conditions on which John first granted the disputed tribune were never agreed to by the people, that if it was paid for the benefit of personal absolution or for the removal of the interdict that laid upon his kingdom, it involved the head of the church in the sin of simony, since no man is permitted to barter spiritual blessings for temporal gains, that if the pontiff went Pontifical claim were now founded on the fact of spiritual benefit conferred. The despotism now imposed on the church might come in the course of time to press with equal force on the state, and the crown itself be looked upon as at the disposal of Rome to see. That if the property were ever the fair possession of His Holiness, the goods of the church could not be lawfully disposed of without an adequate compensation, and surely the rich and broad lands of England were now to be given up for the paltry annual rent of 700 marks, and if the Pope could thus far annihilate the property of the Church, he might dispose of it entirely, that if there is to be any superior Lord or Sovereign above the monarch, he must be no other than Christ himself, that the Pope is a man liable like other men to sin, and where mortal sin is, according to the doctrine of the divines, unfitted for dominion, that the stipulation of a late king, as a fact in the interest of the whole people, could never be held, as either valid or binding, that neither having been made by the kingdom, the kingdom could never uh, descend to recognize it, that the agreement obtained the sanction and the seal of only the monarch and a few of the apostate nobles, and that it was injustice to punish their sins on the liberties and possessions of the posterity. Such was the ground taken and successfully maintained by a reformer in dealing with his masked and monistic opponent. According to Lingard, the treatise in which Wycliffe embodied his reasonings and conclusions does more honor to his loyalty as a subject than to his ability as a scholar or divine. It was neither scholarship nor divinity which was required in conducting this controversy. A simple collation of facts and legitimate Inductions from these facts were all which he deemed necessary to satisfy any honest mind, but his capacity and force of address and the treatment of the subject are not to be depreciated. Starting with the proposition that the condition on which John surrendered his kingdom to the Roman see, which was in itself essentially dishonest, he proceeds by a process of sound argumentation to lay bare the fraudulent ambition and ever advancing encroachment of the papal power so he comes to set forth its pretensions as a vain thing and concludes by saying, If I mistake not, the day will first arrive in which every exertion shall cease before the doctor, the anonymous monk, will be able to establish that a condition such as this can ever be consistent either with honesty or with reason. These sentiments and reasonings did but re-echo the decision of the English Parliament 
which had previously come to the resolution that neither King John nor any other sovereign had power thus to subject the realm of England without the consent of the legislator, and that such a surrender was nothing short of a violation of the coronation oath. And when the mendicant controversy was subsequently submitted to the same August assembly, it was resolved that in conformity with the Oxford statute, no university scholar under the age of 18 should be received into the order, that no document tending in any way to the damage of the national uh, seminary should be hereafter received from the Pope, and that all future differences between the parties should be decided in civil courts and without further appeal. What share Wycliffe had in conducting the defense of Oxford, it is impossible to say. That he was so engaged is highly probable. Nor is it less probable that it was owing to the conscientious and successful part which he played in this controversy that he became the object of royal favor and was elevated to the rank of particular regional clergist or king's private chaplain, a distinction that's not more honorable to the priest who received it than to the prince who conferred it. About seven years afterwards, he was one of the commission appointed by the same prince to proceed to Avignon, where Pope Gregory XI then resided, and treat with him about certain pope, uh, popal provisions against which the English Parliament had recently passed several laws and resolutions. The fact that in his royal commission the name Wycliffe stands second is incontrovertible proof of the estimation in which he was held at court, and of the high reputation which he had acquired in connection with the ecclesiastical questions and movements of his day. But to this we shall have occasion to refer at a more advanced point of our biographical sketch. It is worthy of remark that this simple circumstance of the Medicans, having laid claim to a closer correspondency with Christ and his apostles, and the humility, self-denial, and devotedness, led at once to an appeal to the scriptures as the highest and last authority. The friars themselves having been the first to challenge this appeal, they had no alternative but to abide by the decisions of this divine standard. In the majority of instances, judgments were against them. Not only did they fail to approach their great model, but their life exhibited a perfect contrast. Amidst all their pretensions, they had no claim to be classified with the foreign spirit or the meek of the earth. They were men of pride and worldly ambition, and hence their novel pretensions were easily determined and as quickly repudiated. But more and better than this, homage was done to the Bible. The authority of inspiration was placed before the authority of the institution. The voice of God was heard above the voice of the church. The very appeal to the book implied the sufficiency of Scripture. In all matters affecting faith and practice, the right of each individual man in the exercise of his own private judgment to determine what is and what is not in conformity to the mind of God, Wycliffe had the deep consciousness that the principles which he had espoused and now maintained were in harmony with the spirit of a free Christianity and every successful appeal to the Christian testament strengthened his attachment to the, those principles. It was not in the spirit of fraction, but from the force of an interior divine life that he spoke and acted. With his mind under the influence of simple living truth, he could no more have pursued a different course than a planet, obedient to the central, great central law of attraction, could wander from its appointed orbit. His aim was not the overthrow of the church as a sacred institution, but its purification and corresponding validity. As the more skillful or experienced practitioner would have recourse to amputation only when his life is more or less in danger, so the reformer wished to apply the knife only to those members of the body ecclesiastical which impaired the vital functions and impeded the full development of the structure. He was all alive to the evils from within and from without which now threatened the church. He foresaw that either she must be purified or fall beneath the weight of her own corruption. The failure of Fritz Ralph to effect a reform left little, if any, room to hope that the spirit of improvement would take its rise from within, and therefore Wycliffe appealed to the people and both appealed to the Bible. It may be that our reformer did not foresee whether his inquiries were conducting himself and the country. He was in advance of the age, as every man must be, who would impress his age with some new element and carry it forward in the march of progress and improvement. The fact that his own mind was possessed 
of a living principle was the grand qualification of it undertaking the regeneration of the church and of society. If his own soul had not been quickened by the spirit of life, he could not have acted with living power on the people. End of chapter 3, having been read by Peter John Bruce, is also known as Brian Dean. None of my audience are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.